We will now call our St. Lucie County uh, School Board regular workshop meeting <laughs> to order February 24th, 2015. Want to welcome each and every one of you that are here this evening with us, as well as our viewing audience. We will have our Pledge of Allegiance and Kids at Hope Hunters Pledge uh, and then directly after, we have Fort Pierce Magnet School of the Arts dance students, and they will provide a special presentation. And their teacher is Miss Sarah Agret. So if you would, please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and our Treasure Hunters Pledge. Please remain standing. I am adult and treasure hunter. I am committed to search for all the talent, skills, and intelligence that exist in all children and youth. I believe that all children are capable of success, no exceptions. Board members, would you please go down into the audience? Thank you.
Okay, would you take another bow? Great work. Now, now we are not going to let you get away too quickly because we want to know what it means to you to be a part of the uh, dance group at Magnet School of the Arts. And um, you did a wonderful job. They definitely got their exercise, didn't they? <laughs> That's a good way we can all get our exercise. Um, your costumes are wonderful. And the song and selection was great as well. Now, I saw these young ladies uh, doing Fort Pierce Magnet School of the Arts uh, uh, anniversary, 100-year anniversary. And they did another routine that uh, had to do with, was it sailors? You were dressed up as sailors. You should have saw those costumes. They were fabulous. And it was tap dancing. So they are learning so much uh, different types of dances uh, with Miss Agrate. And we thank you for your work here in this community. And, and we thank you, young ladies, for really doing it. So uh, can I ask, I can't ask, talk to all of you. So one of you like to be the spokesperson? Oh, two of them. Okay, tell us why this means so much to you and why you're a part of the dance group. Well, be well, because I actually love dancing, and that's one thing I've done since I was four. And, um, well, when I dance, I feel a connection with the world, and I think it's actually pretty fun. You can exercise and you can have fun. So it's just two things I love. Okay, you're going to also tell us the same reason why you decided to join the dance group. I decided to join the dance group because I just love to dance. When I get on stage, I feel like a totally different person, and it actually helps me not be nervous when I have to do things in front of the class because I know this is a smaller group than what I'm used to in the audience, so just seeing everybody just makes it easier for me to be able to just go out in the world and do what I have to do. And learning the different dances, it's just amazing. And I can go places and say, I know how to do that. My teacher taught me how to do that. So it's just, it's just, it's just amazing. And I really love to dance. So thank you, Miss Agrate, for teaching me everything that I know how to do. We have such intelligent young people, and what great speakers you are, and all of you are great dancers. I want to hear from you, okay? One more. Tell us why you joined the dance group at Magnet School of the Arts. Um, I joined the dance group because I've always liked done gymnastics, and I thought trying dance would be a better like, way to like, learn more like, things and dances. And it's like a free dance class that you don't really have to pay for. So <laughs> you learn like such great things. And thank you for Mr. Great for teaching us everything that I know and for being such a great teacher. Thank you, ladies. We will certainly have you back. I want you to come back and do that sailor dance for us, okay? That tap dancing. So at this time, you may go back with your teacher. And thank you so much. members okay at this time we are going and we will make an announcement regarding our unscheduled speakers if we have any in the audience, please uh, fill out the forms and bring them up immediately. Over to my left is Ms. Harrison. You will give her your form. Want to go over our vision next. Our St. Lucie County Public School vision. St. Lucie County Schools, in partnership with parents and community, will become premier centers of knowledge that are organized around students and work provided to them. Our name will be synonymous with the continuous improvement of student achievement and the success of each individual. Our promise is to move from good to great, 
focusing on our core business, the creation of challenging, engaging, and satisfying work for each child every day. I will now open up the public hearing, and we have before us this evening uh, uh, the adoption, proposed adoption of amendments to school board policy uh, 711. Uh, is there anyone here who would like to speak during this time regarding the public hearing item that is presented? Seeing none, come forward, Madam Superintendent. We will now have your recommendations. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, I recommend the board approve the proposed amendments to school board policy 7.11 and the definition of possession in the code of student conduct as presented. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Board members, we have received the recommendation. May I have a motion? So moved. So moved by uh, Mr. Ingersoll. Second. Second by Ms. Hawley. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. This time we will close our public hearing. Our next area of business is our uh, special order of business. Uh, Madam Chair, I mean, I'm sorry, Madam Superintendent. <laughs> That's okay, no Madam problem. <laughs> um, at this time, we'd like to ask uh, Mr. Bill Tomlinson to come forward at this time to present our awards regarding the positive behavior intervention and support our MTSS model schools for school year 2013-14. Thank you, Mrs. Jost. Madam Chair, members of the board, Superintendent, it's with the greatest pleasure that I come before you tonight to announce that St. Lucie Public Schools has 10 schools that receive recognition as model PBIS or positive behavioral intervention and support schools. Each year, this recognition is given to schools for the work they've successfully accomplished in developing a multi-tiered system of supports during the previous school year. The recognition tonight of our 10 PBIS schools is for the school year 2013-2014. Each year, the University of South Florida's Positive Behavioral Intervention and Support Project recognizes schools throughout the state that have made model school status by demonstrating innovative, creative, and functional ways of supporting positive behavioral and intervention supports in their respective schools. Specific characteristics of PBIS model schools are their consistent methods of utilizing data to better serve students, teaching PBIS to new students throughout the school year, creative and engaging reward systems, and extending PBIS throughout the campus and partnering with community and parents and including PBIS into daily activities across all available teaching opportunities. PBIS model schools have made a commitment to both PBIS and to the support of their schools, and it shows in the recognition of these 10 schools tonight. You should also note that usually it's less than 100 schools throughout the state that receive this recognition, and St. Lucie County is receiving recognition for 10 of its schools. I would like to ask that Barbara Castine, our Director of Student Services and ESC, come to the podium with me and be here as a support. She works diligently with our staff to ensure that this PBIS project is carried out throughout our entire district. And at this time, it's also our distinct pleasure to recognize Mr. Robert O'Neill, who coordinates our PBIS project. He not only coordinates this project, but works with Dr. Michelle White from the University of South Florida to head our district leadership team. They are continuously working with us for sustained improvement, and we are very proud to have doubled the number of schools this year for PBIS model school status. At this time, Robert will introduce the schools that are being recognized, and the awards will be given out to them at this time. Good evening, everyone. Just thought I'd let you know at about 4.30 this afternoon, uh, USF actually called us. Uh, we've been with them for about 12 years and reminded us that, uh, as Mr. Tomlinson said, this is a distinct uh, award that doesn't go, doesn't go to many schools and reminded, reminded me that over 1,600 schools in Florida participate in this initiative. 
So we're very proud. And uh, also they told me to make sure I had fun, or everybody should have fun. This is a good thing. Okay. So as I call your name, please come to the front of the boardroom so that you may accept the recognition that you so genuinely deserve and also pose for photograph. I'm going to call the schools individually. The schools achieving bronze status for 1314R, FK Sweet Elementary School, please. Individual, I'm going to defer. Okay, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mariposa Elementary School, please. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Oak Hammock, K to eight school, please. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Palm Point, K to 8 school, please. Thank you. <laughs> Southport Middle School, please.
St. Lucie County schools achieving silver status are Parkway Elementary School, Uh, Westgate K-8 school, please. Within the MTSS framework regarding behavior, gold status is granted based upon a system of supports that are clearly identifiable at each of the three tiers, one, two, and of course three. I would like to ask the following principals and their teams to come forward at this time. These schools have achieved gold status, the highest award that USF gives regarding PBIS. First is Weatherby Elementary School. We have two new gold schools this year. First is Bayshore Elementary School. Lawnwood Elementary School.
We are very proud of the accomplishments of the PBIS teams at each of these schools. You are to be praised for your accomplishments and the work that you put forth each and every day on behalf of the children of St. Lucie County and their families. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Phenomenal accomplishment to have doubled the number of model schools in a single year. So congratulations to all of you. At this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Helen Wild and Mrs. Kathy Schmidt to come forward for a career technical education proclamation. Thank you, Mrs. Yost. Madam Chair, board members, Superintendent Yost. As you know, St. Lucie Public Schools, we are very focused on college and career readiness. And a large part of that success involves our career technical education programs. In our schools, we actually have 29 unduplicated CTE programs in our high schools alone. And my records show that is that allows for 67% of our high school population to be enrolled in those programs. So we know that we have great influence on the business community and we involve the community in that. We also allow students to earn not only college credit, but credentials to go into work through passing industry certification exams. And in the last four years, our participation rate and our performance has nearly doubled to 80% passing industry certification tests in the 2013-14 school year. In programs such as construction, automotive, biotechnology, careers leading to healthcare professionals, and so on. The list goes on and on. So tonight we are honored to speak to you on behalf of Career Technical Education and recognize all of the students and teachers for their hard work, and I'd like to ask Ms. Kathy Schmidt to come forward, our Director of Career Technical Education, who coordinates all of the efforts at the schools and in the community. Ms. Schmidt. Thank you, Dr. Wild. Madam Chair, Board Members, Superintendent Yost. Um, we are here now because February is National Career and Technical Education Month. Career and Technical Education, first of all, I thank you for the privilege and the honor of working with our students and leading these programs, leading our incredible staff and working with these talented, wonderful students. Career and technical education has been my passion for my entire career. If you know me, and I know you do, you know that that's true. To me, I believe wholeheartedly in what it offers for our students. It plays a crucial role as well in readying our nation for economic success and workforce competitiveness. Our CTE classrooms are modern-day laboratories where students and educators alike are developing the skills that will power the future of college and career readiness. But here in Florida, our Governor Rick Scott has issued a proclamation in recognition and celebration. I want to congratulate our teachers and our students, our very hardworking students, here in St. Lucie Public Schools. And I would like to ask at this time one of our students to come up and read the proclamation. But before she does, I'd like to briefly explain why this particular student was selected. She's an example of the kind of partnerships that we have in our community as well. We're working currently with Career Source Research Coast and some of their partners, business people and entrepreneurs in the community who have stepped up and said that they would like to help us and help our young people those that are interested in perhaps one day taking the talents and skills they've learned and starting their own business in our community, growing jobs here within our community. So we're working on this process. They're working with the students to help them develop a proof of concept. We've been working with our Chamber of Commerce, with the EDC to help identify some other business people who could act as mentors for these students. And this particular student really is standing out amongst these, these other students um, in her efforts already to uh, begin that process. So at this time, I'd like to ask Miss Virginia Frazier who, from Treasure Coast High School to come up along with her very talented teacher, Miss Maggie Chapa. Thank you. Um, 
So I'm Virginia Frazier. I'm a senior at Treasure Coast High School in the Business Academy. And this is the proclamation from Governor Rick Scott for Career and Technical Education Month. Whereas profound economic and technological changes in our society are rapidly reflected in the structure and nature of work, placing new and additional responsibilities on our educational system, and whereas the efforts of career and technical educators, business, and industry stimulate the growth and vitality of our local economy and of the entire nation. By preparing graduates for careers that are forecast to experience some of the largest and fastest growth in the next decade, and whereas career and technical education serves as a, the backbone for a strong, well-stimulated, well-educated workforce and contributes to Florida's mission to become the global destination for jobs and America's leadership in the international marketplace. And whereas the workers of tomorrow are in our classrooms today and career and technical education provides Floridians with the schools to careers connection, helping students experience practical and meaningful applications of any number of skills. And whereas more than 50 559,000 secondary job preparation and post-secondary career and technical education students in Florida engage in this type of meaningful education. And whereas secondary schools in all 67 school districts, all 28 Florida public colleges, and 47 technical centers offer career and technical education courses. And whereas more than 232,000 students Secondary students are enrolled in more than 1,900 registered career and professional education academies and nearly 3,000 registered career themed courses and have earned almost 57,000 industry certifications. And whereas over 8,000 secondary career and education teachers are inspiring students to succeed in college and careers. And whereas career and technical education offers individuals lifelong opportunities to learn new skills and gain advanced workforce training, providing career choices and potential satisfaction. Now, therefore, I, Rick Scott, Governor of Florida, do hereby extend greetings and best wishes to all observing February 2015 as Career and Technical Education Month. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Stand with me a moment. I recommend the board approve the Career Technical Education Month proclamation as read at this time. Superintendent Yost is recommend the board to uh, approve the proclamation of the of the uh, career and college. May I entertain a motion? So moved. So moved by Ms. Harley and second by Mr. Ingersoll. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And thank you so much for your work. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Helen uh, Wiles and Ms. Smith for all you do. Okay, at this time in, of the agenda, we go into our superintendent search update. Uh, superintendent search candidate update and discussion. I have spoken with our consultant, Jim Hughey, and um, he will not be in attendance today as we can see, but he has given his opinion. And uh, so I'd like to begin to, I'd like to begin by thanking the many people who listened to the candidates and gave us their impressions of them, including the members of the community who attended the meetings last week. I know you went out of your way to, to be a part of that process with your own busy lives, but I want to thank you for understanding the importance of being a part of the process. We've heard from a lot of people, uh, but we've really given ear to those of you that have attended the different uh, committee meetings. The a special thank you to our search advisory committee, our district advisory committee, and the leadership of our unions as well and of our employees. All school board members have received and reviewed all of your comments regarding the candidates. 
And our job today is to select the person or to discuss the selection of the person that we believe will make the greatest positive impact on our students, our organization, and our community. All four candidates were exceptional. And this is a difficult decision. If we had the capacity to bring in several top administrators, we would love to hire more than one of these individuals. The two from out of state were impressive and both were well prepared to be superintendents. But according to our scout, Mr. Hughey, the two who are currently in Florida appears to be the most ready to assume this superintendency and are as well the two that the community has chosen at large. Both Diana Green and Wayne Gent have an extraordinary depth of knowledge, district level leadership experience in Florida, and a track record of success at boasting, boost, boosting student achievement. The feedback we received on both of these candidates was overwhelmingly positive. Diana is an outstanding leader, and her performance in our process last week was superb. It is evident that Diana would bring a wealth of experience and great communication skills to St. Lucie County. She also has a doctorate degree in advanced K through 12 education, and Diana is also analytical and data driven. And she has also a proven success rate of turning failing schools around. In only one year, Diana led academic initiatives to increase 24 schools, at least one letter grade, and seven schools, at least two letter grades. She has increased math scores in her area, reading scores, and writing scores. And she co-facilitated a plan that moved her district from an $8 million deficit to a $14 million surplus in one year. In a very short time span, she has won the hearts of many people in this community. On the other hand, Wayne Gent currently oversees the largest, the 11th largest school districts in the country with 186 schools, 24,000 employees, and close to 200,000 students. Wayne's experience as a superintendent as well as his experience here in St. Lucie County will possibly enable him to come in and to be effective in a shorter learning curve. Wayne's record of accomplishment, especially regarding increasing student achievement in Palm Beach County is most impressive. In addition, he has established relationships here in St. Lucie County as well as with regional leaders that would benefit our district. Of course, for us as a board, all four are still open for vote and can possibly become the next superintendent. At this point, I would like the board members to make comments and uh, being mindful that after the comments, we will have a motion and second and we will also be open for discussion as well. Uh, Ms. Hensley, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, or maybe you don't know, just because something's written on the paper for their reference, we'd go beyond that. We call, talk to people in the community that they have not used as a reference. So we talk to people in other counties uh, that we know, some that didn't know us so well, but uh, individually, we do more due diligence than sometimes I think people realize that we do. Um, Mr. Gent has come to us uh, with a a very, very strong uh, record. Uh, to, reached out to several people in his county of where he's working now. Received nothing negative, even for people who were negative in the newspaper. When I talked to them, they're not really negative. They were very positive about many things that he'd accomplished. Likewise, reach out to people in Manatee County and, and Marion County regarding Dr. Green. Very strong people, very strong candidates. The conundrum is which one is going to work in our community from day one 
that will carry us forward where we need to go and which one has the pattern of being able to work with municipal county municipalities as well as county government. Uh, Mr. Gent knows Children's Services Council, which you know is one of my passions. He's very heavily invested in uh, working in their county as a whole. By the way, he's been working with us as a five county work group as well as consortium. Dr. Green has a great reputation. She's a great lady. She's wonderful to talk to. Uh, but for me, there is uh, a chance for a learning curve that I think that uh, would probably be short for Dr. Green, but I think for Mr. Gent would probably not be there at all. I received lots of input from the community like we all did. Uh, came up at every meeting I went to, very positive with the process, very positive with our candidates that we had. But for, for me, anyway, I can only speak for me, there was almost total consensus on what they were looking for and who made that match. Further comments from the board? Uh, Ms. Holly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, some of my comments may be a bit redundant from the ones that have already spoken, but I, I did want to take this opportunity to thank everyone that has been involved in this process because it has been a community process. We've had folks come in from various aspects to serve as facilitators, to take our candidates on tours of our schools, and all of that speaks to us as a board as to how much they want the entirety of St. Lucie County to be involved and to be part of this process. So our profuse thanks to each of you that for whatever role you played, and there were hundreds of roles um, during those, those few days that, that our applicants were here. I was quite pleased with the quality of the applicants that we received this year. Um, having 25 to, 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 in essence, was a short list of 25 that was further reduced down. But I think that speaks highly of St. Lucie County as well because we had so many more applicants this time than in our prior search. And it says to me that people are noticing that St. Lucie County is making the turn and is doing the right things for their community. So um, thanks to all of you for whatever part you played. I, we've tried to personally thank you all, um, but it was a grueling, grueling two days. I'm not sure my body has recovered yet, um, but it, part of that was by design. We wanted to see how our applicants would hold up under so many, so much scrutiny from so many different groups, and I was well pleased with the, the results from all of them. Um, I have to agree with Mr. Hughey, um, and I want to thank him as well for bringing us all of these candidates. He's done just a phenomenal job for us each time he's been brought in to work with our district. Um, I too agree with him that our two candidates would be Dr. Green and Mr. Gent, and I feel comfortable that either one of them could step in and continue moving St. Lucie County forward. They're both highly qualified. The evidence of their leadership and what they've accomplished in their respective districts stands alone and stands above so many others. We have looked at a lot of feedback from all of the groups and my phone today had to recharge it in the middle of the day because mm -hmm. there were so many calls coming in. And I have to say from the, the groups that I and the individuals that I have heard from, it has really been a very right down the middle. Um, can see strengths in both candidates, can see a learning curve in both candidates. And in fact, I was told several times, I'm glad you're doing this tonight and I'm not the one that has to be up there making that decision. But we have listened and we have read and as Mrs. Hensley said, we have done a lot of due diligence behind the scenes talking with folks in their communities that they're in now. One thing I can say to you, though, is that this board is unified in whomever comes to take the helm and lead St. Lucie County forward. We are unified in the respect that student achievement is not negotiable. Student achievement levels must continue to rise. Our students deserve it, our community deserves it. And this board will be unified in working with whomever is chosen to be the next superintendent. We will 
be that they are one of our two employees. So we will be very energized, very much a part of their everyday life as they come to St. Lucie County and begin to lead this great school system. Um, I probably a lot more to say, but um, I would move on to someone else that might have discussion points. Okay, and these are comments. We will we will we will pack for a motion after the comments, and then we will be open for discussion. Yeah. No. Okay. So we have heard the comments. Uh, at this time, we will uh, entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we entertain uh, going into contract to hire Wayne Gent as our next superintendent of St. Lucie County Public Schools. I second it. Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Uh, Hensley and second by Mr. Ingersoll, and we are open now for discussion. <coughs> if I might interject, one of the um, common concerns that I heard with Mr. Gent was the where he physically resides. And I don't know if you might be open to amending your motion to state that in the negotiations in the contract that it is stated that he will move to St. Lucie County prior to July 1 of 2015. I, I think that is uh, probably his understanding, but we can make sure that's in writing. Yes, ma'am. I think it's his understanding, but we probably need to make it in the motion just so that it's in record because I had the same comments from, from my board member, not my appointees. They put a lot of time and also it was brought up in the community uh, response questions too. So uh, it, it's pretty heavily on on my members' hearts. So did you accept the amendment? And I'll accept it too. Second. Any more discussion? Yes. Ms. Ms. Madam uh, Chair. Um, I think this is an incredibly, incredibly difficult decision, and I have read every single piece of information. I had calls. I had people stop me in church. I had people stop me wherever I happened to be in the grocery store. Um, and these are very evenly matched people. I mean, they, they both are in, really all four of the candidates had so much to offer. I'd love to, I, I loved, uh, our, our one candidate, uh, Chris Marzak, his enthusiasm, I just wanted to plug in his enthusiasm and excitement about education. It was, it was just so exciting to hear somebody who's actually really passionate about education. And so there were good, there were so much good in all four. And I do agree with the comments that were made. I, I think to have high quality people, and this is our, not just our school board, this is our community. And the decision we make isn't just an isolated school board decision, it's a community decision. Um, and I've been, honestly, I've been back and forth. One day I felt one way, one day I felt the other way. I'd read more comments, I'd listen to more people. I will be a team player. I will go with the board, uh, the final decision, and I um, will be respectful and do my very best whatever candidate comes forward as our superintendent. Um, but this is a very difficult decision for me. Um, Dr. Green was amazing. Wayne Gent was amazing. The only difference I could actually find was Mr. Gent has been a superintendent um, that really stuck out to me as far as we don't have time to do training. Whoever comes in has to hit the ground running. They have to know what it is to be a superintendent in this community. We don't have time to do that piece, but um, that was really the main thing that I saw that uh, divided was the fact that Mr. Jen has had three years experience as a superintendent and Dr. Green has not, but she seemed comparable in just about every other area to me. And did you want to say something else, Ms. Hensley? Just that, um, I mean, it was delightful and actually some of the people that we didn't get on our short list, I think we would have wonderful conversations with because everybody that Mr. Hughie brought seemed to have all the 25, at least 20 of them had very interesting backgrounds that would have been very interesting stories. Uh, for me, the concept of how early learning and K-12 education is totally infused in a community for economic development, sustainability, and how entities work together across territory is, is uh, very, very important to me. 
we have a very unique community. We have wonderful people in the seats. And that's why I was so pleased to have people like our county manager and city managers and those type of people be able to provide input because of uh, their perspective on how we need to work together. And I will tell you, it came up today at a different meeting that somebody who's new to our community came here from Palm Beach County, to, and he said he had never seen a collaborative, inclusive community like he has well seen here in the few months that he's been here. And I think that speaks volumes about our community as a whole, and the reason I think we got such wonderful caliber of candidates. I'll tell you one of the things that stand out with Mr. Jen is when we were talking about uh, communication amongst the district and how would he help in her office communication. And I think one of the points is that he said humbly was, as I work with 41 municipalities in Palm Beach, that's 10% of what we have here. And to be able to be able to effectively communicate, and when you call some of those municipalities, they know Mr. Gent and say he's very easy and accessible. And I think that's one of the things as our superintendent it has been and will continue to be is accessible to the community, accessible to our principals, accessible to our teachers, and also accessible to the taxpayer. So that's very crucial. Um, the other things that, that stood out was he knew the PBIS model real well. He had um, some great ideas with uh, tutoring and, 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 achieve, and, a, and trying to close the achievement gap. Dr. Green had the same thing, but again, the experience of, of the years of education that Mr. Gent has and also the leadership styles. And that was another thing, particularly coming from St. Lucie County, if you asked you know, the people that worked with them said nothing but positive glowing things, and that, that was very helpful too. And knowing that he also hires quality people to do a quality job, and that's very reassuring too. So I think we, we're going to get a good one. I must be very um, upfront with what I found within the community regarding both applicants. Uh, the community absolutely, um, when they heard that Mr. Gent, was um, applying. It was an overwhelming positivity from the community. As we continued to go through the applicants in the interviews, I found that those that had been exposed to Diana Green had many of them, and I would say nine out of ten that came to me said they wanted Diana Green now. So it was um, from one part of the community who just because of his rep rep uh, reputation uh, was very positive once those that went through uh, all of the interviews had changed, many of them had, the majority of them had changed their mind. This is how powerful Diana Green uh, was um, in her presentations, um, and I found that extraordinary uh, what I experienced. So um, it is a hard choice. And um, I, too, whoever is the next superintendent, will be 100% behind. Uh, but my recommendation, I think, would be more so uh, Diana Green, based on what I've heard back from the community uh, as an individual board member. Okay, so um, I think that's my discussion for now. Yes, ma'am. One, one thing I wanted to bring up that uh, Mr. Gent, when I questioned him about diversity and poverty, and he brought up the fact that Glade is one of the very highly, highly impoverished areas. And he told me what the strategy that he was using in Glade and how effective it had been. So he actually is in a county that has the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor all in, in one large county. And I like the answers he gave me about the strategies he was using for that community, in particular, Riviera Beach area, Glade, and, I, and so I know that he understands. The main thing to me is somebody understanding our community and understanding what we have in St. Lucie County. And it's almost as though St. Lucie's a little microcosm of Palm Beach in, in many ways in the area he's coming from. And that was something that was important to me. Um, the other thing was early childhood, that he understood the piece of early childhood and long before kindergarten or VPK, um, that has to be put in place, what we do in the early childhood realm, so. I must also, to make another uh, discussion, uh, comment, 
is that uh, many of the people who I spoke with was also concerned about uh, Mr. Gent's uh, board in West Palm Beach and how some of the board members struggled with communication skills with him, et cetera. So this was another reason why people had a, a, a wonder about if he would work well with the board here in St. Lucie County. And I just, wanted to, I just want to be up front with everything so that when we do decide who we have, we, we all know basically what we're getting. Still open for discussion? Okay. Okay, at this time, I am going to call, oh, well, all in favor? Aye. For um, Mr. Gent. Uh, any opposed? Uh, oh, wait a minute. All in favor, everybody said aye. aye. Any opposed? And I know, what, I know I'm hesitating because I don't know what I'm going to do right now. <laughs> but I'm going to go along with our, our board, and I will also be in favor of Mr. Gent. Okay. So um, the, vote has, the vote has been unanimous. And I'm confident that all of us on the board are committed to giving our total support to our new superintendent. Uh, so we will move right on. Uh, we have Madam chosen. Madam Chair, if I might, um, in light of the conversation that we've had and the consensus that we have that these were our top two candidates, might I make a motion that if contract negotiations fail with Mr. Gent, that we immediately open contract negotiations with Dr. Green? Aye. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and, and for my last comment with that, um, if we can get Dr. Green here to work with Mr. Gent, boy, we'll have a powerful <laughs> team. So, Mr. Gent, when you hear this, okay, offer what she wants. No, that's <laughs> kidding. All right. I'll make one final statement that. Uh, this is a community uh, opportunity. So when somebody new comes to our community, we need to make sure that we are the ones who help facilitate and lay, be the liaison with all these different people in our community. We have had wonderful, wonderful superintendents. We have a path that we have created. And it is up to every one of us, those on the dais, those in the audience, and those not even in the room, to make sure our superintendent is successful and that our team stays cohesive and madam chair if i might one more comment um just to reiterate to mr harrell that when you're entering into negotiations with mr gent to please have the stipulation that he must move and be a resident of st lucie county prior to july 1 2015. Yeah. thank you oh i didn't hear that Uh, Mad Madam Chair, it's uh, so long as, as uh, we have had uh, appointed superintendents, a standard provision has been that during the entire term of the contract, the superintendent will be a, a resident of the county. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, are we going to vote? We're going to vote on that. Is that what we're doing now? We're okay. I think everybody's we good. Voted on it. Okay, everybody's good. I wish good I would have said something though. That's all right. Can I? Yes. I, I just want to thank Donna Mills for her leadership through this. This is a very, very difficult process. And I know that all the board members have helped, but Donna is our chair. This has been very time consuming. And I want to personally thank you for your leadership in bringing forward um, what you have tonight. And I think it's really important. This is, this is a huge decision, and your leadership has been very effective, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Hilson. It's our, always our, appreciative when people um, give you remarks that you've done well. Thank you very much. Are we still discussing? No. Okay. I'll bring up Sober. 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 I like the school board Leave report. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, at this time we're going right into our consent agenda. Uh, fellow board members, we have the agenda before us. May I have a motion and second to adopt the consent agenda as presented? Yes. Motion by Ms. Hensley, second, second, second by Ms. 
Hilson. Hilson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Superintendent, uh, may we, Madam Superintendent, may we have your recommendation? Most certainly. I recommend the board approve a total of 14 consent agenda items, beginning with number 6.01 and ending with 12.01 as presented. Are there any board members who has a conflict of interest or item for discussion and separate vote? Seeing none, I um, need a motion, please. So moved. So moved by Ms. Hilson. Second. Second by Ms. Harley. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, very good. We have other business before us. Final orders of expulsion. Uh, Superintendent, may we please have your recommendation? Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, I recommend the board approve final orders 15 004, 15 005, and 15 006 as presented under the final orders of expulsion. Superintendent has recommended the board's approval of the final orders. I will entertain a motion at this time. So moved by Ms. Hilson. Second by Ms. Hensley. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Superintendent's update at this time. Yes, ma'am. First of all, congratulations as a board. I know that was a difficult decision to make, and the unified effort has been evident um, in support of our school community, and I know that will continue under the leadership of the new superintendent, so thank you for that. We have several very exciting items to present this evening, beginning with the introduction of Dr. Andrew Passari, and we welcome you, Dr. Passari. He is the Executive Director of the Hands Clinic, and he's coming forward to share with us some very important information regarding the Hands Clinic that benefits our students so greatly within this district. So welcome. And thank you all for inviting me. The HANDS Clinic is, um, <clears throat> by the way, HANDS stands for Health Access Network Delivery System. There's a quiz when I finish, if you remember that. It's part of the St. Lucie County Health Access Network. Um, it is a free clinic, free medical clinic, a member of the Volunteers in Medicine, and a member of the Florida Association of Free and Charitable Clinics. It is a clinic operated on US-1 in the old Sam's Club, 3855 South US Highway in Fort Pierce. It has been in existence for four years, going on five. It serves and caters individuals, residents of St. Lucie County who are adults between the ages of 18 and 64 who have no health insurance, zero and an income level of 200% of the federal poverty guidelines, which for an individual this year is about $23,000. It was created to provide health care, primary health care, with referrals and some specialties, including mental health and dental care, for individuals who otherwise would have only had access to health care through an emergency room in one of our local hospitals. It was designed as an alternative um, to, to the uh, current system operated in many, many cities and, co and counties around the United States. And it runs entirely on monies derived from grants. Currently, most of the funds come from something called the Low Income Pool or LIP grant, which recently has been in the newspapers because it is going to disappear. It is part of the money that comes from the federal government through the Medicaid uh, disproportionate share dollars. Uh, every state in the United States receives those Medicaid dollars to offset the cost incurred by hospitals that provide free health care um, to their residents. And the reason that the federal government is going to eliminate these dollars is because their reasoning is that since the Affordable Care Act and the provision therein to expand Medicaid uh, in each of the states around the country, there will be little to no need for those dollars. Um, Florida, along with several other states, has decided not to take advantage of that program. And so 
the potential for the loss of money and the continuation of uninsured individuals going forward past June of this year is extremely high. That said, there currently are 65,458 adults in this county that have no health care insurance. Zero, nada, none. 28,000 or plus of those people have jobs. The uh, cost of one emergency room visit in this county currently is $5,170. The Hands Clinic, for the first four years of its existence, has, has had over 18,000 visits. So simple mathematics would indicate that that translates into $93 million worth of health care. Now, I can tell you as a hospital administrator from another state, um, a hospital I last ran 15 years ago, I had a, a bad debt of $28 million. And the only way that I could recover that money was to go to the insurance companies that I dealt with and renegotiate rates high enough to help me compensate for the loss of those dollars. And that is exactly what hospitals in this state do, in every state. And that, again, translates into that insurance company or those insurance companies charging uh, their subscribers more for the health care that they pay for. So one way or another, all of us wind up paying for the services that every hospital provides, so-called for free. These clinics are an answer to that, if, if, if only in the interim, although I do believe they have a reason to exist for quite some time to come. The health care we provide is basically general medicine. Uh, patients come to us with a variety of problems, some of which have been neglected for years because they have had no access to health care. In partnership with the hospitals who do our laboratory work, um, and over the years that's amounted to about $26 million worth of care, um, and with physicians who, have, who are donating some of their specialty times in surgery and orthopedics and in ophthalmology, I believe we've been able to help impact several people in this county. Um, Obviously, by doing so, we've allowed people to continue working or return to work, whereas they might not have been able to do that prior to this. That coupled with the services that we provide for children, which is a very unique program funded entirely by grants from the United Way, in a dental area, we provide dental screening in the public schools in this county and have for four years. So far, we've served about 27,000 children. We do about 5,000 plus per year with one dental hygienist who's a magician. <laughs> uh, Irvin Valson, my dental hygienist, goes from school to school providing dental examinations for children from the lower grades up to the middle grades, teaches them how to brush their teeth and floss, and most times gives them a toothbrush because they don't have one. Probably have never seen one and he teaches them how to use it. And this year we've added a sealant program where we put a sealant on children's molars which will prevent caries from forming in the near future. One of the amazing things that good public health does is over time it allows you to see the fruits of your labor. And what we have seen this year is something really truly remarkable. Wherein these children who uh, Irvin had seen four years ago, and maybe the first grade or the second grade, he's now seeing them again in the fifth grade, maybe, or the sixth grade. And the incidence of dental disease in these same cohort of children that had 70% dental disease four years ago now have 14% dental disease. So the Public health effort by one person with a toothbrush and a chair and a flashlight is remarkable and done with very little money. But the disease prevention that he has come upon and that he has, the result of his effort, has led to is truly remarkable because these children will grow up far healthier than some of the children who have not had the, the ability to get this kind of care. And I'm not just talking about dental care. 
because dental disease in and of itself, bad enough as it is, is just the cusp of the problem because the major concern that we all have in this field is later on with cardiac disease and that's where most of these problems happen in adults. We do have a dental program at the, at the clinic. We have six volunteer dentists. We have 900 patients on a waiting list. Unfortunately, these dentists only give us about six hours a week. All of our providers, all of our physician providers are volunteers. We do have three part-time nurse practitioners, and that pretty much sums up the, the, the professional staffing of the clinic. Um, this clinic does provide, and I think you will agree, a very, very important service for the residents of our community. I certainly hope that by coming here tonight, perhaps you will know someone who needs this kind of care, and I would ask you to please let them know that we exist. One of the problems we have had is that very few people seem to know that we are there. It's amazing to me. I've only been involved with this clinic for the last six months or seven months, being coaxed out of retirement by Mrs. Hensley and her cohorts on the board. Um, and I only, I only promised to do this for a couple of months until I got there and realized what and how important this, this mission is. And I decided that this mission is going to be my mission from now on. And so I'm back to work, so to speak. Um, so therefore, my message tonight is really one of information and asking you to help me communicate, help us all communicate this to the general public. <coughs> because of the tenuous situation with the grant dollars, I've gone out and recruited a development director. Some of you might know Sydney Liebman. Uh, she's joined me as my development director, primarily to seek grants, to publicize who we are and what we do, and to help me generally garner the funds we need to keep the clinic going. Uh, for your information, the clinic's budget is around $724,000 a year. And for that, we serve about 3,500 patients who are on our active roster. We add some every year. We lose some every year. Some graduate to Medicare because they're 65. Some get health care insurance through the Affordable Care Act. Some have gotten health care through the Affordable Care Act and then returned to us. Uh, interesting because while they probably could just barely meet the premium or pay the premium, they couldn't afford the copay uh, when they went to use the uh, insurance. So it's sort of like buying a car and not being able to afford the gas. Uh, so we've had some of those come back to us. But we have a, right now we have about 3,500 patients. Um, we probably have the capacity to do 4,000, but probably no more based on the staffing and the size of the clinic. Uh, but that's, that's a dent. Again, 18,000 visits to an emergency room have been averted. And I can tell you as a former hospital administrator, I do appreciate that. Uh, it saves a lot of heartache uh, at the local hospital. And that's pretty much what the clinic is. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to me. And come by and pay me a visit sometime. I'd love to show you what we are and what we do. Well, Dr. Passari, thank you so much for this informational information. In well, I was a, okay. Anyhow, the information that you shared this evening, it was valuable. And we do see the posts on social media from Sydney. Oh, yeah, she's good at it. <laughs> as well as I'm thrilled that the uh, board coaxed you out of retirement because you <laughs> certainly are uh, a fine representative well, of you. the Hands Clinic and the value to our community. So thanks so much for your presentation well, this thank evening. Thank you, and thank you for your time and listening to me. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Dr. Passari uh, had ran a very, very large hospital and clinic, and I, I don't think he was uh, very comfortable playing golf anymore. So over a couple, of cup, couple of cups of coffee at Panera, he decided that he needed a mission, and we helped him find one. Thank you, Ms. Hensley. Our next report comes from John Lynch. Um, John is our Assistant Superintendent of School Improvement, and we have recently concluded our second round of district-wide assessments, and John will present a comparative um, report this evening. So welcome, Mr. Lynch. Thank you. 
Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Ms. Yost. As Ms. Yost said, I want to give you a, a brief summary of where we are at the end of our comprehensive exam two. As you know, our progress monitoring system in St. Lucie County includes two comprehensive exams, one which is given at the beginning of the year and another one that was given just after the holiday break. So what we like to do is to present some of that data to you in a very 50,000 foot type of view, but you do have a blue folder in front of you that has quite a bit of data in there that I would be more than happy to, to go over with you on an individual basis should you choose to do so. Um, as we gather this data from our comprehensive exams, we want to look at the data in two different ways. We want to look at it from a proficiency point of view. How are our students doing? Are they moving forward with the, the standards being taught? And we also want to look at, at it as a growth model, and it's a very elementary growth model. Part of the problem that we're, we're dealing with this year, there's no baseline data. So in terms of our, our progress monitoring tool, we're actually creating our own baseline. But to do that, if we want to see how are we progressing from the previous year, it's rather difficult to do. So I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through a process that we have for doing that. But I want to be clear that we're looking at two types of data here, proficiency and growth. And that growth there, or the little, the, uh, the picture there of the bug is that 50,000 foot view. But from the instructional side, and I hope I can get the point across tonight, that the, the true beauty of data is what you do with it. The numbers themselves are nice, and we can fill up lots of Excel spreadsheets. But what happens in the classroom with that data is really the art of using data to drive your instruction. So we have to have that 50,000-foot view to see how we're doing as a system. But we also have to get to the classroom and look at that data in a much more focused fashion, which I hope that, that graphic <coughs> indicates. Just a, a quick look at, at our data, at looking at our 3-5 data, whether it's across grades 3, 4, or 5, uh, looking at ELA, and ELA, of course, is English, English Language Arts, Math, and Science. We can see that our proficiencies are certainly on the rise. Uh, we do see some low proficiency ratings there, particularly in the area of math, but keep in mind math as a skill-based type of course is a little bit different than, say, Language Arts where you have some of those same reading strategies that are refined year after year and they get a little deeper into the standard, uh, a little more, more complex. But with math being a skill base, for example, if you haven't been taught how to calculate the slope of a line, that's not something intuitively you might come up with. That's something that, that's taught explicitly. So those proficiencies are lower than some of the other areas. The bright, uh, one of the bright pieces in this particular side is fifth grade science. Of course, fifth grade science is is our throwback course this year, if you would. The testing is based on the next generation Sunshine State standards, and we're looking at some high proficiency rates as well as growth in fifth grade science. Across the, the grade levels of six, eight, uh, if we look at grade six, it kind of follows the pattern that we saw in, in three, five, uh, with the lower proficiency rates in math for the very same reason. In seventh grade, we have a couple of concerns. We're looking at the English language arts with, with somewhat of a reduction in the proficiency rates, as well as with our seventh grade science. So not only are we going to look at student proficiency rates, but that's, that's something we in assessment are going to take a peek at there and to see, was there an issue with the exam? Was, there, was that second ELA exam much more difficult than the first? And that process takes place as well after the the uh, administration of the test to, to improve our progress monitoring system. But certainly uh, the trend lines are, with the exception of language arts and science in seventh grade, still on the upward turn. If we move to high school, we see some of the same kind of trend lines. Uh, ninth grade, ELA is certainly up. Tenth grade, ELA, somewhat of a dip, but not much of a dip. Uh, we will address that and again look at the, the test, but also a rather high proficiency rate, relatively high. Keep in mind, we still have another two and a half, three months of instruction that will take place before the state assessment. And if you look into high school, U.S. history, bio, certainly on the, the upward turn. And again, the pattern follows with math being a skill-based course that we're, we're looking at lower proficiency rates. But keep in mind, some of that material, approximately a third of that material is yet to be taught as the year moves, moves forward prior to testing. The next slide takes into account the, the bar graphs that you just looked at and put some numbers in place. Uh, the nice part about that, if we're looking at our schools, uh, not schools, but tests, out of the 27 grade levels in different content areas, we have an increase in proficiency in 23 of those 27 categories, or 
Some of those particular ones that are, that are on a dramatic upswing are, are part of the school grade, of course, in civics and U.S. history. So that's promising as well. So that's a look at the proficiency piece. Probably the, the more dramatic look or the more important look is to look at growth. And being in charge of the Rising Tide schools, we are looking for growth in those areas. Uh, so I look back to a system that I, I worked to develop when I was at Southern Oaks where we, we were looking at intensive reading teachers and or ESE teachers, where we were looking to show growth within those students. Uh, for example, we might have given what we called the benchmark back then, and an intensive reading class might have been 30 points below the district average. I, I needed a way to validate that teacher's work. So when we took the next benchmark exam, though they might have been 30 points below on benchmark number one, on benchmark number two, if they move to 10 points below, that is significant growth. You're getting closer to the mean, if you would, so those students are growing. And in that way, I could validate the teachers, I could validate their work, and it, it was something to work towards. It also had an effect on, on students who might have been in a, in a gifted program. If they were 20 points above the district average on the benchmark one and fell to 10 points above, that's, that's a, a regress. We're, we're, we're going back towards the mean for those students who should be well above the mean. So we're looking for those students who are behind the district mean to move forward and those students who are ahead of the district mean to widen that gap. And I, I use an analogy all the time when I present this is, is a race. So that packet that you have in front of you that has all of the red and green uh, cells on that, the green cells indicate that you are above the district average. Doesn't necessarily mean growth. You're above the district average. And the red cells indicate that you are below the district average. What I want to do is to take a quick jaunt through how we've developed this measuring from the middle, I call it, or measuring from the mean process to show growth for all, all students, whether you be in enrichment programs or remedial programs. And that little picture to the top there shows a running race. And if I am the guy in the middle with the red shorts, that is the mean, that is the average score, that is the average runner. The, the mental model I want to create is if you are that middle runner, you want to get closer to the lead. You want to move beyond the average. If you're the person in the back, you want to move towards the average. So there's a measurement. So what I ask schools to do is to take a, a look at these two columns in particular, and that plus or minus the math comp really talks about how far are you away as a school from the district average. So I'll, I'll walk you through a very simple example. If the St. Lucie County average in third grade on comp one, and remember that's before the materials taught, was at 13%, and then you are at 9%, still on comp one, you are four points below the district average. If we take comp two, the proficiencies are up, we should expect that, and now you're one point below the district average. That's actually three points worth of growth. So we would look at that score and say, yes, based on those two columns, that particular grade level in that particular content area is showing growth. In the very same way, we may have a, a district average of 15 and your school average is 21, so you're six points above the district average. On the next test, if we look up at that red district average of 31, your school scores at 33% proficient. So you've gone from a plus six, you're six points ahead of the district average, now you're only two points. So is there growth there? Of course not. You've lost ground in accordance with the mean. Likewise, if we, one more example, if that difference between your school average and the district average, the mean if you would, uh, remains the same, of course there's no growth there. So you can actually look on the charts that you have and both cells may be green. Both times you're above the district average. But what, what could occur at one of our higher performing schools is somewhat like the example I said before. You might have been 30 points above on the first comprehensive exam. Now you're 15 points above on the second one. Your lead, so to speak, in that race analogy has actually been cut in half. So the pack has, is gaining on you, so to speak. So we look at it both ways, proficiency and using this very elementary growth model to do that. But what is, what's much more important is how we look at the data. As I said before, it's not about 
looking at the numbers and, and we're five points above where we were before. As a, when a teacher takes that information in the classroom, that's, that's basically meaningless. It, it's, it's, we have work to do, we have an action plan to create, uh, but in terms of the instruction piece, we have to look at it much more in a granular way. So what we, what we look at is more or less saying the, the numbers do not impact instruction. It's what teachers will do when they go back to the classroom and translating those numbers into action is really the art of data analysis and using that data to drive instruction, which is the whole purpose of these comprehensive exams. You know, in, in, the, in the day and age of high stakes testing, we can really call this low stakes testing in the sense that this does not count towards a school grade, it's not an evaluation piece, it's an instructional piece. So what we're looking at at the district level, we look at this in two ways. We look to see trends, so if we need to provide some professional development in a particular area, that certainly is an indicator there. We also take a very serious look at the test itself, and if we have questions on a particular test that the, the numbers just don't seem to jive with the rest of them, we put those questions through a process so that we perfect that progress monitoring tool. So looking at a couple of different lenses, we also look through the school lens, which could provide a more granular look at PD needs for a particular school. It could look at a particular grade level where there might, if, if, if it happened to be a Title I school, where you could put more resources. We look at it at the classroom level. So we're looking at whether it be a teacher's score, and does that teacher need more professional development? Is that teacher a leader and can mentor other teachers? And there's conversations that take place in data chats at schools to, to do some peer observations and peer coachings through that data. And finally, it's at the student level. And using it at the student level, and these are all screenshots from Performance Matters, our teachers have access to this information. At the student level, the teacher can use that to create instructional groups along with their daily classroom observation. You never take the expertise away from the, from the expert. A teacher can make that determination as well, but this helps guides it as well. So we're looking at data in two different ways. It certainly is a, a proficiency piece. We want to see that going in the right direction, and when we don't, we take great concern. But it's also we have to look at it from the growth model. Here, here's one example where we can look at that. Um, if we're looking at the first test there, the Comp 1 and Comp 2 to the left, obviously the proficiency rate has gone down for that particular standard. So that would be a concern if I were a principal. That was something that, that I would want to look at. If it pertained to a particular grade level, we could address that. If it, if it required putting more resources in that particular grade level or a particular classroom, we could do that. Also, at this time of year, when we're, we're getting into our crunch plans and moving forward the last two and a half, three months of instruction, we will look at that and say that that is a standard that we need to give some attention to, some focus to, as opposed to the one on the right where we're looking at some pretty significant growth in the proficiency. That's not to say that we don't look at that as well for individual student achievement, but if we're looking at a trend, if we're looking at a school-wide professional development or a school-wide uh, instructional focus plan or a crunch plan, that's probably one we can devote less time to where we would put more time to the standard on the left there. Again, the beauty in progress monitoring is the use of that data. If we're not going to use it, then testing truly is a waste of time. I would be the first one as someone over assessment to say that. But if we use that data, it's a critical tool. And, and in the times of too much testing, if we look at these benchmarks, it's, it's a one-hour exam, excuse me, these, these comprehensives. It's a one-hour exam twice a year. That represents about one-fifth of one percent of the entire instructional time. Now, granted, there are other exams, and I wholeheartedly uh, will be involved in that conversation of less testing. But for these particular exam exams, it's about one-fifth of one percent of the instructional time. So in conclusion, the data is absolutely not the destination. That's the start. Where the data really finds its beauty and is in the instructional guidance that it gives to our principals, that it gives to our teachers, that it gives to our parents. It's about the results that you receive and what are you going to do with them. That what are you going to do with them is the critical piece. Questions? This is a workshop session, so if there are any questions. It is. Um, uh, Mr. Lynch, thank you for your presentation. and. Um, I know it's a workshop session, but I'm definitely going to be calling on you to come 
one-on-one. Yes, ma'am. Talk to you a little further in this, and, and thank you for coming in. Be happy to do that. And showing us the charts and the data. Any other comments or? Just uh, my concern is making sure that our principals are using the information and our teachers, just as you said, if we're not going to, we don't need to test if we're not going to use the data. And we've been accused of that over the years, of collecting all this data and not actually using it. But I, I hope that we have a method to make sure that our teachers are equipped in knowing how to use it and our principals are able to deliver that to our teachers. And, and I know I'm speaking to the choir, but we have formative assessments and we have summative assessments. The summative is the end of the story. That, that is the result. These are formative assessments that should drive instruction, so therefore there has to be a conversation. There has to be an analysis of the data in order to, to have any kind of relevance to the classroom, and, that, and that's the goal. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you. Some final comments. I know that um, the discussion regarding the superintendent search is of concern to our public and our media services um, team will be posting that on the web as quickly as possible so that our viewing public that um, was not present this evening will be able to see that as soon as possible. Had the pleasure of traveling to Orlando yesterday for the Commissioner's Summit for Principals. It was an honor to recognize our Assistant Principal of the Year for St. Lucie Public Schools, Brooke Wigington, and she's in the audience, so congratulations again. <laughs> as well as our Principal of the Year, Bernadette Floyd. It was a wonderful um, afternoon. At with Disney, and um, so we have a few photos with Mickey Mouse who awarded um, and congratulated all of the principals and assistant principals throughout the state. I also want to reflect upon our Night of the Stars. It was a phenomenal evening. I know that our community really pulls together to recognize our educators, whether they're our teachers or our support staff. This community goes above and beyond to make certain that we have a, a really special evening that does not exist in many districts throughout the state of Florida. So I'd like to thank not only our St. Lucie County Education Foundation and the sponsors that they secure for that event, but also our um, recognition coordinator, and that is Candace Stone. It was a wonderful evening, so thanks to all of you. In closing, um, I will be attending the AASA conference for the remainder of the week. Um, and so I will not be in town for the remainder of the week, but of course we have email and the phone will be operable as well during <laughs> the time out of town. So thank you. That concludes my report for this evening. Thank you for that uh, report, uh, Superintendent Yost. At this time, we turn to our attorney, Mr. Harrell. Do you have any comments? Okay, and so we will go from there to our school board members' report. We'll start with Mrs. Uh, Holly this evening. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to reiterate, as Superintendent Yost said, the, the Night of the Stars was a spectacular event, and congratulations again to all the nominees and to the winners and to all the school families there that were rejoicing with their candidates. So it was really a very special night. Um, this week we have had the opportunity to visit some schools and read to some classes and we are most appreciative of that. It's always um, a good time for us when we can be with students and, and read with them and, and learn what they're learning. So thank you for those opportunities as well. I have no other comments. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Hawley. Uh, Mr. Ingersoll. Yes, ma'am. I do want to echo Ms. Hawley's uh uh, sentiments of visiting schools and I would like to add the spelling bee to one of them too so that was it I, I do need clarification on Mr. Gent does he have to live in St. Lucie County by July 2015 uh, yes uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair Mr. Ingersoll my answer was probably a bit Coolidge-esque uh, the contract since uh, uh, the district has had an appointed superintendent have always included a provision that for the entire term of the superintendent's service uh, he's a resident of St. Lucie County because the he or she for the viewing audience and for those of you here that when we talk we can't ever talk amongst ourselves 
So when I have a question directed, I directed it to my uh, consultant, and he was going back and forth as a conduit between Mr. Gent and myself. And when Mr. Gent first applied, and I, because I owe apology, apology to quite a few people, and, and it was my fault for not bringing it up. But when Mr. Gent applied, I was on. I asked him, not Mr. Gent, but Mr. Hughie, if he would move to St. Lucie County, and he has a, a a child that's going to be a senior, and I was under the understanding that we we're going to try to work in the, the contract that he would be able to stay in wherever he's living. I don't even know where he lives, Martin County, for the year until his kids graduate. And being a product of someone that has moved probably more than, than half of everybody here, I've probably moved 13, 14 times before I graduated from high school, from, from high school, and I attended three different high schools, I understood that request. Now, I know that you guys might not have had the same conversation, so that when I made my motion that he lives in St. Lucie County, I didn't put a time limit on it until after we took the vote, and then I heard that provision. So just saying, as a board member, if the contract gets held up with him living in the county for a year, because when he applied, that was under the impression that he was under he was applying for. That, but if it works out, fine. If not, yeah, it is what it is. But that was my interpretation when we took the vote, and it was cleared up after when Miss Holly made her comment. So, can I regress a moment then? Because I, I think, and Mr. Harrell, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I brought it up originally I did mention that he needed to live here by July 1 2015 so. oh I didn't hear you say July 1 I just said live in st. Lucie County yeah. so and I I think I don't I can't speak for the rest of you but that's always been my understanding that, that that's fine I, I was just because again when I was thinking it I was thinking through the conversations that I had with mr. Hughie and that was one of the, the stipulations I thought so Okay, we're going to move right along to um, Ms. Hensley's uh, report. <clears throat> I wanted to. Ms. Hen Ms. I'm sorry. Well, Ms. Hilson, Hilson, go. But I, you I, want me to go? Hilson. She can go. <laughs> I, I, it's okay. I just wanted to make it clear that you heard me say Hensley, but that's okay, Ms. Hilson. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, there is the state of hibiscus. It's at uh, Indian River State College. It is basically to tell what's going on with Hibiscus Children's Center, but beyond that, it is going to be a panel discussion regarding child well-being, uh, uh, use prevention, foster care. The DCF secretary is supposed to be here, uh, people from several other agencies, such as the Child and Youth Cabinet should be here. So if you're free, you might want to be able to attend. That would be good. It's 9 o'clock. It will be over by 11 at the latest, I understand. Uh, the, the Florida Children's Council is meeting uh, March 5th and 6th in Tallahassee. That's the opportunity for 15 or 16 of us, whoever show up, uh, to meet uh, the different department heads come to us, the After School Network, the he Department of Health, Secretary of Education, all those people come to us, and we get to uh, have an opportunity to have some significant dialogue. So any issues that are of import, uh, if you'd like for me to bring it up, I have no compunction about bringing up any topic. So. Be glad to bring it up. Um, also, I think uh, Mr. Sanders would be happy to know that sidewalks, local coordinating board sidewalks and bike paths have drawn some uh, state attention and the state coordinator for that through the Department of Transportation has been on the ground to look at safe passage for children and adults, of course, but mostly for children to see what needs to be done and to see if we can uh, fast pace some uh, some money into some key areas. So that's going to be coming up shortly. We're supposed to be getting a report back uh, actually in March. And uh, the other thing that is on here is that I put in your box today is a local market update. As the housing market gets stronger uh, and uh, the tax base starts to recover, it's a very good thing for us and for our future budget. So I gave you uh, the list that I got today. Um, it goes through, uh, shows the change from uh, January of 15 and January 14, that one year period. The median sale price has gone up 23 and 4 tenths percent in one year. 
So that's a very, very good indicator. And I think we should all take uh, great joy in the fact that it looks like things are actually starting to recover, which will make some of uh, our finance people's jobs hopefully a little bit easier. Thank you, Ms. Um, Hensley. Ms. Hilson. Okay. Uh, just wanted to thank Mr. O'Leary for our HMH update, our trip on the buses. We went to Southern Oaks and got to see all kinds of exciting um, programs going on. There's a program where students are able to take um, their computer, what is it, their tablet home, 40 students at Southern Oaks. And this is an ongoing program and we're seeing how it's developing. They've only lost one computer uh, to damage. It was exciting. We got to see how middle school kids build virtual roller coasters, which was very impressive, very impressive. So I thank you for that, and thank you to HMH for sponsoring the lunch. And also, I was able to attend uh, the Shine, the latest Shine for our new teacher's uh, introduction into working in St. Lucie County. Very impressed. Uh, with our curriculum department, they're doing a great job. I got to meet some of the, the ladies and gentlemen and speak to them and encourage them. So two good things, and along with the Night of the Stars, of course, which was amazing. So thank you. OK, I believe all board members have given their updates. And so we, at this time, are going to go into um, our mission statement. But we see that we do not have any unscheduled speakers tonight. So with that, uh, we will go directly into the mission statement. The mission of St. Lucie County Public Schools is to ensure all students graduate from safe and caring schools, equipped with the knowledge, the skills, and the desire to succeed. Our next board meeting will be March 10th, 2015. At this time, meeting is adjourned.